welcome and a joyful welcome to you at home this afternoon. I'm joining you live um, from the exhibition Piment Seram, The Medium is the Medium is the Medium, an illuminating exhibition of five decades of the artist's work, co-curated by Indu Vashist, Tolene Took, and coordinated by the South Asian Visual Arts and the Art Museum at the University of Toronto. We are so pleased to have you share with us through your screens this upcoming conversation with Indu and Tolene, along with fellow um, curator and academic uh, to Polly Dewan. Presented with our longtime friends at the Indian Summer Festival and uh, moderated by their artistic director, Sirish Rao. Um, welcome, uh, Indu and Tolene and to Polly and Sirish. Uh, we encourage you as well to come to the gallery if you can um, to see this extraordinary exhibition. I continue to feel very privileged to serve uh, in the role of director here at the gallery with a wonderful team, uh, including today uh, Jordan Strong, who is uh, joining us remotely, and Cecily Nicholson, who has coordinated this event with so much thought and care, along with Alana Edwards, Sevi Baines, and Avishka Makujaya, who uh, you'll meet through the chats, and as well to Devin Scott, who's masterfully uh, facilitating all the tech for today. And before we begin the conversation, I would like to recognize that we are here in Bear Creek Park where the salmon run in the fall and also sometimes um, the eagles fly above. And it's, um, we're on unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. So that includes here, Semian, Casey and Kwantlen First Nations. The gallery as a team is committed to continually deepening our learning and our work about the land and anti-racism and systemic change. And that's in all areas of our work. So from exhibitions, collections, education, engagement, to labor in all its forms. And now um, I'm most thrilled uh, to welcome Suresh. Uh, Suresh is a writer, a festival producer, and a curator with a really, um, really deep connections in the art world. He has worked with a range of visual artists from South Asia and the diaspora including um, Bharti Kerr, Baju Shyam, Orjit Sen, Rock Media Collective, as well as uh, Sandeep Jopal. He has curated exhibitions at the Museum of London, the National Institute of Design, the Musée uh, K. Branly, and also the Kunsthal. As the co-founder, uh, with the exceptional uh, Laura Bias, um, Bias Falco, um, the um, annual Indian Summer Festival. And together with their team, they have been responsible for highlighting some of the world's uh, most critical contemporary artists and thinkers, uh, including those of um, the voices of Arundhati Roy, uh, John Berger, and so many more, and introducing them and highlighting them to, in the region. And I did also want to mention, and while they uh, they recently announced that this will be the last year for them at the helm of this, you know, really beautiful and formidable um, uh, festival and institution and society. Uh, we look forward to them rolling out their upcoming program in July. And also we're tremendously excited to see for them what's uh, ahead next. And so uh, without further ado, welcome Sirish and really looking forward to you guiding us through this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison. It's, it's really very kind of you to make mention of that. And it's uh, such, a, such a thrill always to, to work with all of you at the Surrey Art Gallery. Uh, thanks for all that you do. Um, and for having me here, inviting me to be part of this conversation of the art of P. Mansaram. It's truly an honor to moderate this event for me and to be keeping company with three very distinguished curators who I believe you know, make a significant impact on the Canadian and international visual arts landscape, Indu Vashis, Tolin Tuk, and Deepali Diwan. It's um, also been, thanks to the three of them, a, a true delight for me to begin to learn more about this extraordinary artist, P. Mansaram. Um, I think when Jordan Strom at the Suryat Gallery sent me some images of his work, I was both astonished because I'd never seen anything like it and at the same time, I felt I was in a familiar and, and loving landscape. Um, and for someone like myself who grew up in India, surrounded by a culture that is extremely garrulous, that is filled with storytelling on every surface and on every street, uh, the work of Mansaram came to me as, you know, as something that 
finally answered, I think, uh, the kind of in-betweenness that I also felt and gave me, in a sense, a visual home. And um, what was really beautiful, um, a lot of you will have heard that the, the talk is in conjunction with this exhibition at the Sariat Gallery, the medium is the medium is the medium, which itself sounds like a kind of incantation. Um, but uh, it did give me the sense almost like P. Mansaram had created a language almost, a language of his very own um, that was so beautiful to see in the work that, uh, that they have at the gallery. Um, the gallery has, I think, something like 40 artworks in total. So uh, it, it's really amazing to see so many works out here ranging from the 60s to up until the 2000s. Uh, it's also across various mediums. There's work on fabric, on ink, on serigraph, uh, mixed media collages, and even some uh, moving images. So it's really uh, amazing to see the output of this prolific artist, but also that we have finally access to it over here. And uh, um, for that, we really have to thank, um, you know, Tolin, Indu, and Deepali for all the work they've done over the years to do this. I'd like to introduce the three of them now uh, and also say that apart from being experts, apart from being so deeply engaged in P. Mansaram's work, uh, I think what's important is also they knew him as a person, they knew him as an artist, they went to his home, there was a relationship there that is so clear in the way they speak of him and his work and an intimacy that is so rare. So again, uh, I would like to thank the three of them for all the care they've taken to, to uh, bring this work to us. I'll introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. Um, each of them will speak for about 10 minutes to start off with to really locate Mansaram, his life, his work, this exhibition. And then we'll go into a slightly more free flowing conversation and we'll end with a Q&A for about 15 minutes. So those of you who might have questions during all of this, please make note of it. Uh, you can pop questions into the YouTube chat channel. Um, I'll pick up some of them um, and share what I can with the speakers and, and get them to answer that at the very end. Um, I'd like to start with Tulin Tuk. Tulin is a curator, a cultural producer, and a facilitator working uh, between Toronto and Amman in, in Jordan. Uh, while in Toronto, she's the artistic director of SAVAC, which a lot of people know as a brilliant nomadic artist-run organization that really amplifies the work of marginalized artists here on Turtle Island. And in Amman, she's the co-founding director of Spring Sessions, which is a yearly residency program that brings together artists and researchers and cultural practitioners in a collaborative and experiential learning environment. Um, so as we go into things, uh, Tulin will really Tell us a little more about how this uh, exhibition came about. We also have with us Indu Vashis, who has, again, is also associated with SAVAC as the executive director since 2013. Uh, she's worked various artistic practices from theater to writing, uh, but really I think what drives her is the quest to be and teach embodiment. So it's not surprising she's also a yoga and somatics teacher on top of her uh, work in art. And she also says that she's interested in art that is not precious and words that are precise, which is probably her cue to me to say, move it along. Um, and finally, we come to Deepali Devan. Deepali is the Dan Mishra Senior Curator of South Asian Art and Culture at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Her research really spans a broad swath of colonial, modern and contemporary visual culture all across South Asia and the South Asian diaspora. Um, she has a focus on photography and she's the author of several books, including uh, the brilliant Raja Deen Dayal, artist photographer in the 19th century and embellished reality, Indian painted photographs. If you can get your hands on either of those books, count yourself lucky. And um, yeah, I, I am so pleased to have the three of you here. Thank you so much for all the work you've done and for making the time. I'd like to, I think, start with uh, Tulin. Um, Tulin, it would be really great to know since this exhibition is not the work of a few months or even a few years, um, can you give us a sense of how it all came about? Yes, of course. Um, thank you, Sirish, uh, for this introduction and thank you to the Surrey Art Gallery for bringing us together today. Um, I guess I could start at the beginning. Um, 
and tell you about how this exhibition came about. Um, in 2018, the Art Museum at the University of Toronto um, was planning for a show called Vision Exchange, Perspectives from India to Canada, together with the National Gallery and the Art Gallery of Alberta, um, which included works by around 20 internationally recognized artists from both India and Canada, thinking through issues of sovereignty, borders, migration, and exile. And they approached us, they approached Savak to curate a kind of parallel exhibition um, at their other space, the Justina Barnica Gallery. And um, we really took that opportunity to present the work of P. Mansuram, who at that time we considered to be like an underrepresented Indian Canadian artist um, that was really not recognized enough as part of the art canon at the time and had not been shown enough, um, especially in Toronto even though he had been practicing as an artist um, in Canada for over 50 years. And Savak had already had a relationship with Mansuram. We had shown some of his works in group shows or in film programs over the years, um, but we've been wanting to work with him in a bigger capacity. And this was the perfect and timely opportunity to do so. And it was also the start of a, a really close relationship that Indu and I developed um, with Mansuram over time. Um, if you, we can cue image four, please. So um, at that time in 2018, that's when we started making regular visits to Mansuram's home and his studio in Burlington, um, talking to him intensely about his work and getting to know him better. Um, we'll talk more about his personality and his, his personal life in a bit, but I just wanted to say here that um, Mansuram was a storyteller and every work that he had and that he did, had a long story behind it. Um, and it was intimately linked to his personal life. So every story about a work would be a, a story about his life. And he would um, spend many hours uh, telling us, recounting memories from his past, uh, talking about his daily and diligent practice of both art and yoga, and about the context of his work between India and Canada, and the deep relationship that his work has to place and his um, diasporic and migration experience. Uh, Mansuram was a prolific artist and um, he had a daily ritual of making work. So obviously, you know, we were kind of already overwhelmed from the beginning with the amount of work that we could choose from. The artist had literally like hundreds um, of pieces that we could consider. And we decided early on that what was really important for us uh, for this exhibition was two things. Uh, one was to show the breadth and longevity of the artist's practice but also to show the connections and the threads that link the works over time. So um, like you said, Sirish, we chose works that start you know, from the 60s and up to the last decade, but we did focus more on his earlier works also to show how relevant they still are in the contemporary moment at this moment. Um, so the selection of works that you see in this exhibition that is now in Surrey highlights both the material and spiritual elements from his everyday life including characters, symbols, and spaces to convey his meditative and transcendent processes in both form and content. And his ability to work in multiple forms, his assembling of different media and aesthetic concerns and references um, really presents the viewer with this nuanced and complex and very personal narrative of migration and diaspora. If we can cue image five, please. So, there are many themes um, and topics throughout Mansaram's work, um, but in our curatorial thinking for this show, we wanted to highlight his practice of repetition, uh, which can be seen in different ways um, as a methodology in both his work and his life. So this practice reveals the thread of lineage between Mansaram's different works. For him, repetition is art practice, but repetition is also meditation, it's spirituality, it's a way to finding God, and it's even love. As he once told us, seeing an image in multiple places is akin to being in love, the image of your lover appearing to you everywhere. And you'll see in many works in the medium is the medium is the medium, repetition and reappearance of human figures, abstract shapes, animals, buildings, and others in the same pieces, but also between and across different pieces of work. So for example, we can talk briefly here about the figure of the horse as an example. 
where we can see in this piece in its regal form, this piece is called Maharana Pratap and it's mixed media on paper. And again, we can see it appear in a different form. If we can cue image six, please. In rear view mirror number 54, which is a mixed media work on plywood. And this makes us start to think about how, for example, the figure of the horse here takes on new meanings, changing over time and in different contexts. So throughout his work, we find many examples of such figures and shapes morphed, redrawn, repeated, and mirrored. Sometimes it's direct and obvious, where Mansaram creates elementary shapes like circles and squares in various solid colors. You can see that in some of the textile pieces, for example, or when he silk screens the same pattern across the same canvas multiple times. But in other times, it's more subtle, where we see symbols like the horse or images of gods, for example, or even certain words and language make surprising appearances in ways where they are not exact copies of each other, but more like stories told and retold over time. So in this image that we're looking at, um, on a green pasture of paint, the horse's plastic figure dashes along facing both a miniature Maharaja horse and a crudely hand-drawn replica of the same horse. If we can cue image seven, please. And then in rear view mirror, a 16 millimeter film, we see the horse again, several times, appear in a completely different medium and on the streets of Bombay. So this almost hallucinatory repetition becomes both intentional and spontaneous, both rigorous and playful and both personal and public. We can cue image eight. And here we see the horse unexpectedly again in The Message Man, which is a serigraph print on paper. It was a collaboration with the cultural theorist Marshall McLuhan, who could, we can maybe talk about more later, who was his friend and collaborator in the 60s when Mansaram came to Toronto. And finally, if we can cue image nine, please. We see the horse appear again in rear view mirror number 19, another mixed media piece. And this time as part of a pattern on a piece of cloth that is collaged with other materials on canvas. So one other thing to note here that you may be noticed is his also repetitive use of rear view mirror as a series of titles in many of his works, a kind of homage again to Marshall McLuhan and the idea that we're constantly creating our past while living in the present. So the images we saw are just some examples of how we see strategical recurrence and repetition through a variety of medium, including across drawing, painting, collage, text, and film, and at different temporalities. So in a way they're invoking unending feelings of time travel through material dimension and territory. And I hope that you know, for those of you who haven't seen the show, that you'll start to notice these strategies and techniques of Bansaram across many other of his uh, works in the show. Um, I wanted to also briefly talk about um, the tour and the other stops of the tour um, of this show and how um, each one of them kind of took a different um, feel and meaning because of, you know, changing times and also changing circumstances in the artist's life. Um, so after the art museum stop, the second stop was at the art gallery of Burlington, which um, had two additions or two um, changes and differences from the first leg. The first one was that um, unfortunately Mansaram's partner Taru had passed away before the opening of the show in Burlington. And we added a section in the exhibition that was an homage to her and the influence that she had on his life. And the second was the addition of the textile pieces, um, which you can see in the show in, at the Art Gallery of Surrey, um, which was a really important addition because obviously they're beautiful, you know, we thought they were beautiful pieces, but also some of them had never been shown before. Um, so we really wanted to, to share them with um, audiences and to also show another aspect of the breadth of the artist's work and his ability to use um, different mediums. And Burlington was also obviously a very important stop because it was a personal uh, stop for Mansaram, um, his networks and relations in Burlington, where he had lived and taught for most of his time in Canada. And now in Surrey is the last leg of the tour, which is a really exciting achievement, but also maybe slightly sad because it's the first time the exhibition is being shown after the artist had passed away. 
Um, but maybe that gives the, the exhibition a new meaning regarding Mansuram's legacy and his place within Canadian art history. Um, he was incredibly proud of the exhibition and ecstatic that his work was uh, finally being shown with big institutions in Canada. So thankfully he was with us for the first two legs of the tour and he got to experience them, them both. Um, and we are especially excited to see how the works will be received um, in BC and see what transpires after that. Thank you, Tulin. It's, um, it's, uh, it is very special for us then. And, and thank you for continuing the act of storytelling that Mansaram began. And uh, it was something very beautiful when you were speaking. It, it reminded me there are a lot of bardic storytellers in India who, when you ask for a story, will begin with the creation of the universe. And if you say, no, no, I'm looking for this specific story, they'll say, hang on, no story without the creation of the universe. So it seems to me that there was a bit of that in, in Mansaram too, like everything that that act of reaching back, which is uh, which is so beautiful. Um, and and speaking of that, of speaking of going back, um, um, you all knew him very well, and and um, I, I'd love to hear from Indu a little bit about his life, uh, his beginnings, uh, and also interestingly, Indu, you seem to share with him this arts and embodied yoga practice. Um, that's a lovely connection. So uh, if you would give us a, a sense of, you know, uh, where he came from, that would be lovely. Thanks, Sudesh. Um, so Mansaram had this tendency that Taru would used to admonish him for, like the bards would start with the beginning of the universe. He would always start his story in Mount, Mount Abu Rajasthan. Every story for him began there, and that's where he was born. He was born during the sixth cholera pandemic um, that took 11 members of his family in India. And so that was in 1934. And when I first thought about it, or when, we, when he would tell us about it, I would think, oh, what does it mean, the sixth pandemic? And now that we're in a pandemic, I think we understand that these things can happen in waves over the course of time. So the cholera pandemic took uh, a, a pretty big section of his family and his relationship to his family and to Mount Abu, it was marked by that grief and the alienation um, of loss um, due, due to a pandemic. So this was a very big formative part of who he was. Um, during that, so he, he, he was born into a large family, but was left with um, his father and a stepmother, and I think perhaps an uncle. And that was a very difficult relationship because he really wanted to be an artist and that his father really did not want him to be an artist. And um, he left quite suddenly. Um, so he left Mount Abu. Um, and as a young art student, he, he wanted to go to Bombay. And he was inspired by the history of art and his everyday surroundings. And like Sadesh mentioned, he was um, inspired by billboards and advertising and pop, you know, popular culture, posters and early computer art. So he finally went to um, the JJ School of Arts in Bombay from 1954 to 1959. And the JJ School is a colonial institution in Bombay. And it's a, it was a generative space um, in the post colony. So you think, okay, 1954 to 59, India is a new nation uh, just gaining independence. There is so much excitement during this period. And it was here that he met the love of his life, Taranika, um, as Tulin mentioned. Um, and when they recounted their art school days, he would always boast that Taru was the topper. Taru was the, the star of the, of, of the school. So if we could cue image 12. This image is of Taru and Mansaram. Um, he had this image pinned to his built, uh, bulletin board in his um, in his studio, and you see their their connection. And you know, while Taru ha was an artist in her own right and showed a lot of work also and made a lot of work, and it was all over the house and very very different from his aesthetic. She really buoyed his career. She um, was was his go-to. Um, he always said that her choice in colors was always more interesting than his. And 
you know, um, but she always, you know, supported him in, in his career. So there was something very beautiful in that, in that way in which they relied on each other. So in the 20s and 30s, uh, Nehruvian socialism ignited experimentation in India. And it was, a time, it was a time to create a new nation, a new society, and also new art forms. And Taru at the time was employed by the state to start an art education program and um, children's museums across the country. And she uh, went to learn our education techniques at MoMA. And um, at the same time, Munsaram um, had his first position after art school at the Weaver Service Center in Calcutta. And he took the opportunity uh, while working at the, um, at the Weaver Service Center to work with traditional weaving techniques. And um, he also went on to kind of create cutting edge textile works one of which was used to decorate the room where Jackie Kennedy stayed um, when she was Nehru's guest in 1962. And that piece actually still hangs there um, at the Children's Museum in Delhi. I always thought, think of Mansaram as a bit like Forrest Gump. He was always sort of at the right place at the right, right time and meant, met all of these characters um, at the right uh, at the right time, his life was full of kismet, um, which is char uh, characteristic of this post post independence period. Between 1963 and 1964, Mansaram went to study in Amsterdam um, on a Dutch fellowship where he learned printmaking. At the time, he didn't have money to buy an airline ticket to go to Amsterdam. And he learned that Air India had just started collecting Indian modern art. So he wrote to them and he offered his artwork in exchange for airline tickets. And um, Air India's modern art collection is um, at this point, um, a slice of Indian's art history um, connected to the national um, post independence movement. So the aviation leader has become actually, it was a platform for young artists who were painting the new language of a new country. Um, around this time, and I, I really would love to see this work, but Mansaram and Taru were commissioned by Gold Flake Cigarettes to um, create an ad advertisement for the cigarettes. So they created this experimental uh, film that played in, um, in front of each film at, and cinemas to, as advertisement for Gold Flake Cigarettes. And so I rem remember asking him, what did these films look like? Um, and he said that it was this, this one long shot of an artist sitting in a desert, looking over the desert and for inspiration. And um, it was like this sort of long film in, and then ended with the artist sparking up a cigarette and enjoying that this moment of solitude with him and the cigarette and, and, and this landscape. So this just gives you a sense of, you know, what his eye was like in some sense. In Amsterdam, he met members of the Cobra group who worked to embrace um, artistic experimentation. And he was really influenced by that passion of experimentation. And he developed his love for experimentation there. But at the same time, he was miserable in Amsterdam. He, was, he always complained how cold it was and how bland the food was. So he wrote to the Indian embassy and he asked for the addresses of every Indian resident in Amsterdam, there was four different families. So he wrote them all letters and they all responded. And he just said that that's how he survived Amsterdam. He would go to each one of these four houses for dinner and uh, met these families and was sort of connected with his homeland through these interactions. In July, 1966, um, both uh, Mansaram, Taranika and their three month old daughter, Mila moved to Canada. And um, serendipity followed Mansaram to Canada. He quickly established his art practice in his new home. In, upon arrival in Canada, first in Montreal and then in Toronto, Mansaram reached out to Marshall McLuhan, to whom he had previously written after being impressed by a Life magazine article about him. McLuhan was at U of T and um, they, he had phrased the, the, the term, the medium is the message. And in their friendship, I think they worked on projects for many years. And I think Mansaram kind of took 
McLuhan's ideas and visualize them. He put them in into this into this practice and through visualizing the ideas. And he collaborated with McLuhan on a project called the East West Intersect, which was a happening. Um, and a I think it was film screenings and there was performances at, at the Isaacs Gallery, um, a location um, that was quite big. Um, I believe it was in Yorkville. And um, it, in terms of the, it was a forefront of the Toronto art scene from the 50s almost to the 80s. And he also went on to produce a series of collages as um, and other works that, as Tumi mentioned, called Rearview Mirror. And these were um, inspired by, by McLuhan's ideas. As a way of supporting his family, Munstrom quickly found out that you can't make money make, being an artist in Canada, and he had a family to support. So he started working as an art teacher in Hamilton. And he did so until he retired in 1989. And so through the 70s and 80s, he was balancing teaching. And every day he would continue to make art into the night and on weekends. And so he was very committed to his art practice. But he was also very committed to making sure that art teachers were always art practitioners. So he would organize these shows with his fellow teachers that were um, art teachers making artworks and they were they were shown once a year and this was a very important thing for him if we could cue image 11 so this is a, a, an image of Mansur and Taranika's house in um, Burlington in Garden View Terrace their spacious and welcoming home was designed um, they designed it to be a balance of function and beauty um, the tall back windows were filled with natural light. They had this lush, beautiful backyard and um, that light kind of brought in this lushness. On the back veranda, they would host eclectic um, variety of intimate music concerts in the 70s and 80s. The soundtrack of their house was filled with Hindustani classical, Ghazal, Kowali. Every time you went to his house, you would just, the house was full of music and they would host these concerts um, and they would, you would have these um, duddies, these large duddies, um, which he gifted to Tulin and I actually, and these small duddies where you would sit and watch these concerts from the backyard and um, the concerts would happen on the veranda. There were the most unexpected um, corners in the house, like the garage, there's dark cor corridors between rooms, crawl spaces, and of course, Mansaram studio, where we encountered both Mansaram and Taranika's artworks. And, when we went to the garage as he was cleaning out this house, we, we went one day to help him clean out the house after Taranika died. And there was this enormous, enormous, beautiful work called Moon Landing. And he told us he worked all night, the night of the Moon Landing to make this work. And so anywhere you would go, you would encounter artwork and it was just this delightful experience. Um, the house was just decorated in colorful paintings, prints, collages, sculptures, textiles, coupled with found objects from India. If you see the pillar in this image, it's covered in these um, wood carved um, block prints. Um, and, you know, there's all, all of these different beautiful um, stamps and um, vessels, sculptural vessels all over the house. Um, terracotta sculptures, pots, inviting the local and flora, to, flora and fauna to play in. In short, their house wasn't just a home. It was also a place of leisure and play for them as artists. And Taranika's signature specialty was her hospitality. She would bring tea and snacks that would start promptly at four when visitors were regaled with stories of their, of their art school days, their lives as teachers and um, their travels all over the world, and also their hustle as professional artists. I think for me, that was a, the most interesting and exciting thing to hear about is how they also practiced. Their homes was an extension of their creative lives, I think, and I think it's really important to highlight how important and nice it was to be invited into that space. Um, he participated in numerous exhibitions from, um, 
and um, they there was there was some moments in which his work was shown in Canada. So the Rearview Mirror series traveled across Atlantic Canada from 1971 to 72. He um, always traveled to India, where he showed in prominent galleries um, at Jahangir Gallery, Gallery in Bombay and um, Dumimal Gallery in in New Delhi. And so, you know, that's that's a bit of how he lived his life. And then, um, as Tulin mentioned, this show started um, before the pandemic. And then um, the second iteration was, um, you know, during the pandemic at the Art Gallery Burlington. And, um, you know, when the pandemic first started, he would call us every Sunday morning, like the uncle that he'd become to us. And we would talk about how he was born during a cholera epidemic which took 11 members of his family, as I mentioned. And during that time, as he'd always done, he made work in tune with the changing world. And in his final year, he started a new series of work that was a, a departure from his signature maximalist style, but also kind of reminds me of a couple of the works that we have in um, this show, which we called the minimalist works, um, which are these two, um, two textile works on white um, cloth that had these very minimal images. And he made those works while he was quite ill. Um, and um, there, was, there was a time in which he was having a lot of heart problems. So he made these kinds of works. And um, the works that he was making in the last year of his life after Taru died and during the pandemic were simple line drawings that he would make um, every morning after yoga and meditation practice. And he said to me, this is a time in history that's meant for quiet, solitary, spiritual reflection. And I held that very close to me when he, when we were talking about that. Um, and when we last saw him, and so this will be image 10. Um, so this is a, this was a, a moment in which there was a, a bit of reopening during um, 2020 and we, we, had a short, very small outdoor um, open um, celebration of his life um, at the Art Gallery of Burlington. They had this beautiful courtyard. So we had this moment where people could go in and see the exhibition and then come out. And um, we, we, it was maybe the first big social engagement any of us had in, um, in months. So it was really quite beautiful. And so what I want to say at, at the end of this talk is to say, you know, his life was bookended by pandemics, but he always managed to find uh, ways to express his uh, creativity in tandem with the mood of the time. And I think that to me is the essence of who he was. He was so interested in what was happening in the mood of the time. And that always translated into his artwork. And I think you see a lot of that within this show. Thank you so much, Indu. It's, um, it's great to get a sense of this world gathering, very syncretic life, um, starting with his beginnings to here. And um, yeah, just, and it's so, so nice and so important that you were all able to be around him in those final years and in this strange time. So this makes the exhibition all, all the more special uh, for that. Um, and, you know, now that we've got a sense of how this all came about and where he came from, I'd really like to ask Dipali to maybe lead us through how all that found its way into his work. What were the themes that he constantly explored? And uh, I believe you at the ROM, Dipali, have, I don't know, something like 700 works of P. Mansaram, which is a staggering amount to create and then also to have. So I'd love to hear from you on, on some of those themes that you've seen. Thank you, Suresh, and I'm happy to be here and contributing to this panel. Um, before we begin, I just want to send my greetings out to Mila uh, Mansaram and Tharu's daughter, who is actually joining us uh, from Arizona. She's out there watching, and uh, because this is uh, streamed through YouTube, I know we can't see you, uh, nor everybody else who has joined us today, but please know we see you. Uh, so say, saying my hellos. Um, I wanted to share um, some uh, few other works uh, by Mansaram so that you all can get uh, a deeper sense of the range of his practice and, and some of the 
uh, strategies and characteristics that he used. Um, I met Mansaram in 2002, uh, shortly after I moved to Toronto and, and joined as a curator at the ROM. And his gentle persistence led me to make several studio visits over the years. Um, and after talking to him many times, I found myself starting to hit record whenever he would talk um, about his life, about his art training, about meeting key figures in the art worlds of India and Canada. Um, and I felt that this was a story not just about one artist, but in fact, a nuanced and fresh take on mid 20th century modernism and how the global South and diasporic experiences fit into that. So I felt like there was a story there in his life that hadn't been written anywhere yet and that it hadn't really been incorporated into um, art histories um, uh, broadly uh, in the world. Um, uh, in the, um, around, uh, in the 2010s, um, he started uh, talking about downsizing and um, started threatening he was going to throw everything out. Uh, and so uh, uh, I felt like there was something, you know, that had to be done uh, right away. And so between 2015 and 2017, we were, we were able to bring uh, more than 700 works uh, into the ROMS collection uh, to be able to be preserved in a public institution for posterity. Um, and this really uh, is a broad representation of his work throughout his career from the time he was an art school student uh, up to uh, uh, right before he passed away. Um, and so uh, I think that that will be an archive that we will all be able to appreciate well into the future. I wanted to start uh, image 13, please, uh, with this image that shows uh, Mansaram with his wife, Tarunika, or Taru, as she was known, um, in their home in, at Garden View Drive in, in Burlington. And, and this is sort of how I remember them. Um, it's in their living room. And um, Indu did a great job of, of uh, sharing how much uh, Taru was, was a partner in the creative practice uh, that they both had and how much their home was part of it. Uh, but in this image, you can see in the background um, some of the works on the wall and on the far right uh, are actually works that Taru herself produced. Uh, she was uh, a ceramics based artist, um, but worked in multimedia as well. And uh, his, her works were displayed alongside his uh, in their home. Um, the image also shows an important aspect of their kind of environment uh, that they lived in, which is the kind of folk art that she collected uh, during their annual trips back to India. And you can see, for example, that earthen pot uh, on the floor and the carved wood beam uh, just above her head. And, and this is the kind of material that was uh, spread throughout the house, mixed into the artwork and served as a kind of visual reference. Um, for um, their life, but also their practice. Image 14. Um, this image uh, actually is a photograph that was taken at the moment they migrated to Canada uh, in 1966. Um, and it shows um, Mansaram in the center and the far back of the group, uh, and then in front of him, Taru, uh, and then you can see a three-month-old baby Mila on the, in a, a, bas a basket um, uh, towards everybody's feet. Um, and this is at the Bombay airport uh, when they're about to leave uh, to um, you know, start the next part of their lives. And uh, all the people around them is the extended family, in this case, Taru's extended family, who became a wonderful support for Mansaram, especially after he lost so many family members. Um, himself. And so um, this is 1960s, you know, when there was a lot of uh, South Asians um, who were uh, becoming part of the diaspora. Uh, they had professional photographers at airports to mark those moments of passage and everybody dressed up and came to the airport uh, to see them off. Um, and so this, for me, this, this image uh, really kind of preserves a sort of moment in time uh, not only for Mansaram and Taru specifically, but in general, the kind of diasporic experience um, uh, that changed the art world um, at the time. Image 15, please. Uh, this work um, 
uh, is uh, one of Mansaram's um, uh, early works, among the first that he did when he came to Canada. Um, and it's one of my favorites. I wanted to share it. Um, uh, done between 1966 and 1968, it's a work called Maharaja. Uh, and what you see here uh, is basically a collage, uh, a fairly large in size, uh, about a meter and a half square. And um, you'll see uh, a lot of ephemera pasted on and collaged on to a canvas uh, within a field of uh, orange paint. Uh, and this work very much represents the kind of work he was doing during this time period, 60s and 70s. Um, and even though it's called Maharaja, it's actually all about Canada. And if you look closely, you can see uh, a number of images clipped from newspapers of Pierre Trudeau. Um, and uh, for Mansaram, Pierre Trudeau's larger than life personality reminded him of the kind of Maharajas that he was familiar with from Rajasthan particularly Ram Singh II, whose uh, face uh, with the spectacles you see uh, there uh, in the middle of the canvas. And, um, you know, uh, Ram Singh was known as the father, father of modern Jaipur, uh, just like Trudeau came to be known as the father, father of mo modern Canada. Uh, and in many ways, this is, uh, gives you a sense of how Mansaram related different kinds of things from his different worlds that he inhabited. You know, these were um, analogies that he made and visualized on his canvases. Uh, and uh, it's striking because both uh, Trudeau and Ram Singh um, understood the power of the camera to manipulate the self image. Uh, and so this idea of the image and its manipulation um, and media and how do you how do you work with media is something that uh, pervades Mansaram's uh, work. Uh, image 16, please. Just wanna show you uh, a detail of that work so you can see much more closely the kinds of um, ephemeral uh, and found imagery that he would use for his collages. So for example, you know, you see religious texts, handwritten Sanskrit religious texts that he sort of tore up and, and pasted on the canvas, um, astrological charts, clippings from newspapers, um, clippings from art magazines, for example, that little um, Indian beauty with the parrot, uh, sort of iconic image um, from uh, Indian art history. Um, and, uh, and then his own little drawings and doodles around the canvas. And so in many ways, you know, these types of found objects um, that he, uh, arranged um, on the canvases in a very intuitive, organic fashion. There was no uh, planning out, you know, um, on a separate sketch, uh, how these things would go. Um, but what these are, are not necessarily religious texts combined with um, items of popular culture, but in fact, all of them were found objects within his daily environment. They were all forms of media culture, of popular culture. Um, that he was interested in, they were not precious. In some ways he was interested in the things that weren't precious, interested in the popular and the low tech. This is, I think really gets to the heart of the medium, which is the term in the exhibition's title. You know, the medium is the medium is the medium. Uh, as well as collage as one of the main techniques that Mansaram worked with and the sense of overlapping. In some ways for Mansaram, collage was a form of visuality that best captured the diasporic experience, uh, this idea of overlapping and mixing images uh, from different worlds. Number, uh, image 17, please. So this is another canvas from the similar time period around 1970, and it's called Kissing Movies. Um, and this is a really fun piece and gets to um, also a sense of Mansaram's interest in um, issues of the day. So what you see here um, is uh, an image of, of, of lips, kind of, uh, and it's a lenticular print, meaning it's the kind of photograph that if you move to one side, it changes, and then if you move to the other, it changes again. So it was a set of lips that were puckering. Um, and the title, uh, and then also you see um, a little uh, cutout cartoon um, of two 
little figures kissing um, and it's and uh, it's called uh, kissing movies. And this is all about, you know, what Mansaram's observation was um, about the ban of ki kissing in the Indian film industry uh, that was instituted in 1952. When this work was made, in fact, there was had been a film uh, that had been released that had where one of the songs um, had one of the steamiest scenes in Indian film history to date, and that really challenged that ban on kissing. Um, and it was actually because of that movie that some of the policies um, and bans around kissing were modified. And so in some ways in this image, you know, it's a very playful take on what would have been a topical um, uh, issue in uh, pop culture, uh, in, in the environment, um, of India at least, or in the South Asian diaspora. And yet he's also paired it with these bold colors, abstract um, uh, uh, approaches and geometric shapes, which are all the hallmarks of high modernism. And so he is drawing on a visual language that's coming from many different places at once. Uh, this work is also part of this rear view mirror series um, which he had uh, a number of works a part of uh, during this time period, inspired by the writings of Canadian uh, media theorist, Marshall McLuhan, I think as uh, Tulin had uh, mentioned before, um, which, uh, so McLuhan had likened the experience of being in a media saturated culture with seeing the world through small fragments as if moving by, as if one would see it out of a rear view mirror. And so for Mansaram, this was a comment also on how we experienced media culture uh, in the present day. Uh, image 18, please. One of my most favorite works in the Rams collection is this one here. And it gives you a sense of the real range of, of practice that he was engaging in. This is a very almost simple, very quickly done drawing. Um, uh, black and white uh, with ink uh, and uh, a wash, uh, showing the figure of the Hindu god Hanuman flying overhead carrying a mountain. And this is a scene from the popular uh, epic tale, the Ramayana, um, alongside of a vacuum cleaner. And you can almost imagine the vacuum cleaner coming right out of uh, an ad in a magazine that Mansara might have come across. And uh, in some ways um, for Mansaram, there was no difference between religious content and an ad for home appliances, uh, especially the kinds that were coming out and becoming more common in middle-class homes. For him, I remember him saying once, they're both miracles. Uh, and so this relationship between, you know, the miracle power of, of, of um, the gods that are part of our daily environments, and this is sort of the ethos of, I think, South Asian culture, but also this sort of uh, home appliance and modern technology that created a sense of wonder at the time. So in some ways, again, making analogies through a felt level and in, on an intuitive level. Image 19, please. Um, another one that um, is a collage. Uh, here you see a photograph of a winter scene on Highway 403, which is the main uh, highway connecting um, Toronto with the suburbs, uh, especially going to Burlington. Um, and a collaged image of Ravan, who was uh, the um, uh, uh, demon in the Ramayana. Um, uh, or I should say the villain in, in the Ramayana. Um, and this is also uh, gives a sense of Mansaram's keen humor um, where uh, here you have the um, villain, the multi-headed King of Lanka ready to fight Ontario winter on highway 403. You know, he has his sword drawn. Um, and in some ways, again, it's about the presence of gods in the daily environment and the popular story from Mansaram's youth um, these were the superheroes, you know, like a Superman, um, uh, the figures in the Ramayana, um, and that there wasn't really a separation between the mythological and the physical world. Image 19, please. I'm, I'm sorry, image 20, please. Um, and then the last one I wanted to share is something that was done much more recently. So this is in 2005, uh, a work called Pushkar, uh, which is a 
small town in Rajasthan, uh, not far from Mount Abu. Um, and uh, this is a place that uh, Taru and Mansaram would go, would uh, visit uh, um, each time they went back to India. Uh, uh, and um, what this represents is you see an image of sort of a, a temple, the side of a temple um, uh, with uh, some cows walking around, a figure, uh, a group of women in red saris in the foreground. Um, and this work is a um, digital print on canvas that Mansaram took photographic images that he took and collaged them on the, on the computer. And so um, being someone very interested in um, media, he was always up to date on technology. And so when he started playing around on the computer with digital images, there was a whole different um, frontier for cat uh, collaging that he discovered and would mix together photographic images, collage them on the computer, print them out, paint on them, scan them again, put them back on the computer, print them out, paint them again. And so um, this form of using different media that seemed to be so out of the box, he in fact developed his own uh, name for it, which he called Mansa Media. Um, and so this was you know, his own kind of trademark way of working with uh, media um, in, in different ways. Uh, the double image here uh, references a stereograph view. And so thinking again about photographic technology, media technology, low tech um, as ways that keep coming up, up and again. Um, so for me, I think Mansaram's work very much addresses um, how uh, his strategies and techniques reflect the diasporic experience in his artist practice. But I think it also shows how the diasporic experience is central to globalism, uh, global modernism, as well as the figure of Canada uh, is, is part of that unwritten history of global modernism as well. Thank you so much, Deepali, for taking us through all that work. And it actually seeing Mansaram's work gives me the opportunity to legitimately use one of my favorite words in the English language, which is palimpsest. Um, you know, it, it, this feeling that there's a manuscript which has something below it, which has something below it. Uh, often when you see a street in India where the posters have been stuck and torn off, you know, something, there's a temple festival on top of that is a diabetes clinic, on top of that is a Bollywood poster and they all show. So it's, it's amazing. Thank you for giving us a, a peep into that. And actually there's a question for you from the, so someone in the audience if you could go back to uh, to image 14, uh, I think they wanted to know who the faces are uh, in uh, image 16, sorry, image 16, um, the faces that are in image 16, especially uh, the Maharaja himself. Uh, so if we look at image 16 again, um, you can see a few small clippings of Pierre Trudeau uh, laughing up there um, uh, and uh, just, um, uh, I don't know how to say in the in the just to the left of the of the middle of the canvas. Um, Ram Singh the uh, second Maharaja of Jaipur from the late nineteenth century is in is the large face with the um, glasses on, uh, and uh, the smaller image of uh, turbaned Maharaja in that kind of yellow bordered oval. I actually don't know who that is, uh, but it wouldn't be too hard to figure it out. Uh, these types of Maharaja portraits were fairly common in the 19th century. And I'm guessing that that was cut out of a poster that was based on those earlier forms. And so this kind of what gets called calendar to art was a popular form of visual culture. You could buy it from image uh, uh, sellers on the street. Um, and so uh, if anybody out there knows who the Maharaja is, please put it in the, in the chat, uh, but it wouldn't be too hard. It, I'm pretty sure it's a specific uh, person. Um, the rest of it is astrological charts, uh, Sanskrit manuscript, looks like another clipping from an art magazine showing some um, uh, reliefs of animals uh, from a temple relief. Uh, and there's quite an abraded painting there um, 
which looks like a goddess, uh, but uh, it's uh, pretty blurred out. Hmm. It's funny, it reminds me of the way we talk in India, sort of one on top of the other, like not at the same time, like here we're being quite, you know, quite orderly and all, but um, otherwise we would, you know, the voices would be all, all at once. Um, but really, I, you know, I feel between the three of you, we've got such a, such a deep and rich sense uh, of Mansaram's life, uh, location, work, and, and what you've done um, for this. Um, I'd like to shortly go to questions from the audience. There are a couple, um, but before we do that, uh, I just wanted to get a sense of, uh, you know, obviously you've all alluded to Marshall McLuhan. Um, so a little bit about that relationship and maybe what did he face when he got here? What was the art scene that he entered? Because he came from a very rich developing art scene, but when he got to Ontario, what did he meet? Shall I start? Yeah, I'll just jump in. So, you know, I think the relationship with Marshall McLuhan is, is quite significant. Um, uh, as Indu had mentioned, uh, Mansaram first encountered him through an article about him in Life magazine when he was in India and wrote him a letter. But it was only when he got to Canada that he was able to meet him. And my understanding is, is in fact, that he was introduced through Av Isaacs, of, uh, who is the owner of Av Isaacs, Ga uh, Isaacs Gallery which was quite a fixture in, Tor in Toronto in the, in the 60s and 70s, where some of the most innovative artists were showing. Um, and they uh, saw, they had so much synergy in terms of their ideas. And I see it very much not as, you know, one influenced the other, but in fact, there was a meeting of minds. And this was not all that unusual for Mansaram. He had a way of meeting all the important art figures and the most creative thinkers around him. So even in India, you know, he had uh, met uh, M.F. Hussein, he had met Satyajit Ray. And so coming to Canada, it was not all that unusual for him to then meet Marshall McLuhan and, and engage in a dialogue with him. Um, Mansaram uh, designed uh, two of his book covers um, and uh, collaborated on a few artworks um, where Marshall McLuhan actually paints and, and actually writes words into, onto the canvas. Um, and I think they had a, a, a real exchange for most of their life. Um, in terms of uh, the Canadian art scene, um, you know, most South Asian diasporic artists, um, they, they go abroad uh, because they have a sense that they're going to be successful, more successful uh, um, elsewhere, uh, usually in Western countries. And I think for many of them, what happened uh, was that uh, in fact, what, well, let's talk about Mansaram. Um, ironically, he might've actually been more successful if he had stayed in India because what he encountered in the Canadian art scene was a, a fairly conservative art market that was focused largely on abstract landscapes. Uh, I think that's safe to say, um, but, uh, and also being uh, someone who was not living in the downtown Toronto core, but eventually settling uh, in a suburb in some ways he, you know, his work and the nature of his work, um, uh, there were so many things that, um, that marginalized him uh, and didn't allow his art to uh, gain much visibility until very recently. Um, I'll let Indu and, and Tulin say more about that. Um, Indu, maybe you can you can uh, talk more about his relationship with McLuhan, but I wanted to link it to, to the title of the show, but also just kind of add to what Deepali was saying. I think one of the other reasons why he got marginalized um, in terms of his artistic practice is that I don't think he was also making work in this kind of like typical expected way or the aesthetic and form of his work was actually unexpected um, from a diasporic artist working between India and Canada. So there's something also the, about the way he was making work, but, but really the aesthetic of his work that I feel like was underappreciated because it was difficult to locate. You know, now it's fantastic that we've brought this works together and Dipali has been um, giving attention to his work for much longer, um, which is really amazing. Um, but it's, you know, interesting to think about why his body of work and his aesthetic was not part of, you know, what was considered um, 
uh, the ways or like the expected ways that diasporic artists uh, make work. Um, and I think, you know, his, like you were saying, Dipali, like his collaboration with McLuhan on a kind of like a, um, a kind of physical um, artistic collaboration, but also an, a conceptual uh, collaboration and really thinking about how um, Mansaram's use of the collage, uh, like you said, and the manipulation of the image and, and media, but specifically the collage as a way of layering these different narratives and, and also borrowing from McLuhan's idea of the global village and cross-cultural communication, um, and this dialogue kind of that's happening between the East and the West that McLuhan was really interested in. And Mansaram was actually, is was that, and he was embodying that and he was making work about that. So thinking about the medium as this way of communicating, this in-betweenness, this middle ground. Um, and also I think for Mansaram as a way, like how the medium can be, you know, the object or the person or the animal uh, through which, um, ephemeral kind of or spiritual communication uh, takes place. So, you know, when we when we decided on the title, um, we were inspired obviously by the medium is, is the message, but we really wanted to kind of play on that more and also kind of cement this idea of the medium being Mansaram's strategy and also to circle back to this idea of repetition, right? Um, and actually there is a small nod to Gertrude Stein in the title. And this is um, came out of a conversation with uh, Barbara Fisher and Sarah Rubayo Sheridan from the Art Museum who were actually really two really important figures in bringing this exhibition together and touring it. Um, and um, we were having a conversation about Stein's um, a saying or sentence, a rose is a rose is a rose. And, and she was, in her thinking, there's no such thing of uh, as repetition, but repetition is insistence. It's insisting on practicing and expressing and remembering and using and reusing. Then one quick note, because I think my colleagues have done a great job of uh, referencing this. I think Mansaram was really proud of his friendship with McLuhan. He mentioned it a lot. And I, I think Dibali is correct in saying it was a meeting of the minds. And um, when you get to watch the East-West happening, there's some, there's some documentation from that happening. And at the art gallery of Mississauga, they actually did a little bit of uh, uh, where they showed ephemera and there was interviews with McLuhan and Mansaram. And so you really got to see and see and sense how they understood the moment, the idea of a global village and media being the thing that brings, makes the global village possible. And I think um, you see that in his work, but also be, he has the advantage of being a diasporic artist and being able to have multiple visions and experiences. And I think um, he, in this way, embodied this idea of the global village. He lived here and that that image of Ravana on Highway 403, I think it's that is exactly who how he experienced the world. And he saw these things, that um, these very disparate contexts be able to coexist. And I think that's in many ways what McLuhan was trying to explain through words. And he was able to do that through images. Thank you. Yeah, it's really nice to see this important collaboration. And I think the other very important collaboration with his wife, Taronika. Um, and, and thank you all for really highlighting that. I wonder if uh, she actually informed some of his choices, some of his practice as well. Tibali, do you wanna go for that one? You know, uh, I, I guess I would say, you know, absolutely, I'm sure she did. Uh, but teasing out, you know, what that was, I said, work still need to be done. Um, you know, a, a lot of her, her work is in storage right now. And, and in some ways, she needs uh, uh, some attention as well. That's, that, that would be amazing. And actually, on that note, I want to bring in a question from a member of the audience to that effect, which is Akil Virani, who asks, um, any of you as curators, can you talk about where you stand on the different approaches of correcting the canon 
by you know ensuring the representation of underrepresented artists so sort of rejecting any canon that presents a single linear centralized historical art of arc how does that apply to the work of mansaram Hindu or Tulin, would you like to take that first? It's <laughs> <laughs> a complicated one. Um, maybe Tulin, you can tell you tell your perspective first. I mean, um, I think you know this is the work that Savak tries to do as much as we can. Um, I think, you know, we work a lot with emerging artists and with established artists in the in the kind of contemporary art scene to kind of highlight their work and also develop their work with them. And Mansaram, you know, obviously was a very different scenario because he's been practicing for so long. He's much older. Um, and so, you know, for us, it was a great honor to be able to do this also as a small artist run center to be able to, you know, collaborate with the art museum and, and do this was, was, you know, one of the biggest kind of projects that we've done over the past years. And it's interesting, I guess, to use the word correcting. I think, you know, visibility and representation are obviously really important, but I think, you know, we need to go beyond that too. Um, so even something like investigating um, Taru's work further and thinking about the relationship of her work to his work and, and their effects on each other would be another way to kind of dive into both Taru's practice and Mansaram's practice. And, you know, raising questions about, about who the canon is and who decides who the canon is and how, how can we make interventions within that. So I guess, yes, it is a very complicated question. And, and, and from, from our perspective, the most important thing is to also go beyond visibility and representation and to and to think more deeply about this work and to have researchers write about them and to have art critics um, talk about these works critically as well. Thank you. Yeah, that, Dipali, you were going to say something? I was just going to add just my perspective on, on the issue of the canon. You know, I, I guess I'm, you know, this sort of approach to additive art history uh, is one thing, um, but in some ways, uh, you know, you can keep adding forever uh, and you'll never have all the holes filled. Uh, and so uh, in, in some ways, continuing to add just reifies the canon uh, each time. And so I guess my perspective would be more about um, blowing up the canon uh, and, and getting rid of the notion of the canon. Uh, what are we left with? I'm not sure. Um, and in some ways, maybe additive art history is what you do while you're blowing up the canon and no one's noticing. And then all of a sudden, maybe one day you realize the canon doesn't exist anymore. So I think those two things can, can work side by side. Thank you. And I think the work that all three of you do not only is not only adds, but actually confounds, which is, I think, the first step to blowing up. <laughs> so th thank you for doing that. Um, there's another question uh, from Mandeep Work. Um, you might have addressed some of this before, uh, but um, what art movements and artists does Mansaram allude to in his work? And is there a sense of how his work changed uh, from India to coming to Canada? Is there a sense of that difference? Um. As I mentioned, he was really uh, influenced by his time in Amsterdam, and that was the, the biggest shift that we saw in his work pre-Amsterdam and then after Amsterdam, when we were going through chronologically. Um, his work while he was in Amsterdam um, was still quite uh, influenced with what was happening at the JJ School of Arts and Indian Modernism, and then after he went to Amsterdam and um, became familiar with different print techniques. I, I think there was a, a marked shift in, in his practice. And then, um, so I wouldn't, I, I don't know if Canada has much to do with it. And then of course meeting McLuhan and having a meeting of the minds there um, was, was a, a, another kind of um, sort of perspective shift for him. 
what school, like schools I would put him into. He, his work is so unique. I think like it is really, truly a very, very unique, um, but you know, there's, he was involved in many different movements. Um, he was involved in male art movement for um, a long time. He um, was very involved in the um, uh, xerography movement, which was um, playing with um, um, photocopy machines. And um, there was a whole um, organization that was devoted to that. So he was a part of many different artistic movements, but I think aesthetically his work really stands out as, as being quite unique. Thank you. Dipali, you were... Uh, you know, just to build off of that, I guess, um, if one had to identify certain things, you know, he, he was trained in Bombay at the time, sort of the progressive artists were around uh, or after that. And so he was aware of what was going on there and the debates that they were having about modernism and, and abstraction. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, and, and I think he pulled that in, but at the same time, he was also pulling in other debates about the relationship between Indian modernism and folk art, uh, Indian modernism and, and religious art, pre-colonial art. And, um, and yet his work doesn't look like anything else that doesn't look like any of the solutions that other Indian artists came up with um, for the, those relationships. Uh, and then the Cobra group, as Indu had mentioned, is really important uh, for uh, opening him up to printmaking techniques, but also the sense of layeredness that you find in his collages came out of the Cobra group, although he never was really part of the group. And so, you know, again, there is this kind of incredible sense of absorption of a lot of the debates and issues uh, from different art schools, but not really participating in any one. Thank and you I so much. The, the piece on Canadian art, you know, his relationship to the development of Canadian art and his, 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 his position in that um, has yet to be really, um, uh, I think, really explored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's incredible, really, to for us to have a chance to hear from all of you like this this vast landscape of geography and mind that Mansaram traversed. And thank you so much. It's it's really I, I'm feeling like oh my god, time's already passed, and it's and we're we're at wrap up time. But I I wanted the audience to hang on because we have a little treat from P. Mansaram uh, to, to round off this event. And we'll, we'll uh, leave you with that shortly, a, a small video piece uh, that he made. Uh, but uh, before, so that'll come, so please hang on. Um, but, but before we get to that, I just wanted to take a, a second to, um, to thank you all really, Indu, Deepali, Tulin, for spending the time with us today, for all the work that you've done um, uh, in, in bringing this exhibition and to thank also Sorry Art Gallery and the, and the tech team who you can't see here, but has worked really hard. Um, everyone else at the gallery, Allison, Jordan, Cecily, Savi Baines, uh, and so many others who've, who've made this event and the exhibition possible. And, and just like to say that P. Mansaram's work is work that you don't see once or twice, that, but that in the, in the very name, as the very name suggests that you will return to and return to and return to. So may your visits also be an act of repetition May each time you go, you see something new. And you know this talk, whether you've already visited or not, I think this talk will be a, a richness that you will approach the work with the next time you go there. So a deep, deep thanks to the three of you for joining us, for making all this time. Um, and um, I wanted you maybe in any one of you to choose to set up a little bit uh, the video that we will leave the audience with tea sipping man, a little piece of moving image delight uh, for your afternoon. And with that, I'll say, uh, you know, uh, have a wonderful rest of the weekend and over to any one of you to set it up for us. So I'll just say some quick words. So this little video that we're leaving you with um, uh, is part of his practice. And I think Indu and, and Tulin mentioned how much film was also one of the mediums he engaged with. It's a recent video he made in 2012 made for the Kala Godha festival in Bombay. 
It's only about a minute and a half, but what it does is it really reflects, I think, what was Mansaram's keen um, skill at observation and human relationships. Um, and um, what you'll see is uh, an image of a picture seller during his tea break. Um, and the uh, little video is overlaid with filmy music, so film from uh, Bollywood music. And really it's very much like a visual poem. Uh, the pictures on the back wall uh, overlaid with the close-up of the man's face is like a collage and the audio element. Um, and the subtleties of facial expression and body language uh, just come through in this little snippet. It's so simple and yet so um, impactful. It feels like one can even taste the spicy, milky, sweet tea and feel the pleasure in that moment of calm that you get in the middle of a, of a busy afternoon. Uh, and uh, the last um, little bit of the camera leaves you focusing on the man's hand, uh, making a little gesture. And, and if anybody has enjoyed that kind of tea in the middle of a busy afternoon, you know that gesture, you know, you know it, and it's, it's one of pure pleasure. Uh, and if, you know, if there was a gesture or a mudra associated with sipping tea in the busy afternoon, that would be it. So please enjoy. Chal me kya ji? Achab ki hal chal. Aakhon me kya ji? Rupa hela badal. Badal me kya ji? Kisi ka aachal. Aachal me kya ji? Achab ki hal chal. 